All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Samir, and I'm a program manager. I lead the connector platform for Microsoft Flow and Power Apps. Uh, this is my clique. And uh, thank you so much um, for uh, coming here. Uh, we are going to talk about how you build connectors. And this is a level uh, 300 session. So we try to start with a basic connector, how you can get started. But then we also want to go deep into some of the more advanced topics on connectors. So this is the agenda that uh, we are going to talk about uh, very briefly. We are going to tell you what is the power platform and how you, and then we go about building our first connector. Um, and then we'll showcase some of the new features that we have released, uh, integrating Azure services. And then we'll talk about the architecture, how to write a uh, trigger, and then um, how you can certify your connector if you want, right? And then we'll take some Q and A as well. So the Microsoft Power Platform is what we, uh, what we give to the customers so that they can build great enterprise application. It's a business platform, and we have Power BI, Power Apps, and Flow. Uh, with Power BI, you can do great reporting with your data. With Power Apps, we provide you a low-code, no-code way of building apps, so drastically cut down the time that you do to build apps with Flow, we, uh, we allow you to automate your business processes. So we think of this as you, you can use data to analyze and get insights from it. You can use Power Apps to build apps that you can act on the data, and then you can use Flow to automate uh, with the data that you have. The Power Platform is powered by data, right? And the data can be in the common data service. So the common data service provides you a great way to store all your business entities, all your business data. But if your data is not on the common data service, we provide you connectors that allows you to get data wherever it is. And so this session, we are going to talk about connectors. The value that the connector brings in is because of the value that we provide on the platform. What we have seen is that with the Power Platform, with the, way, uh, with the low code, no code way of building applications, we drastically cut down the time and the cost to build application, to build your solution. And even large enterprise IT, they get a value out of it. Even though we say that uh, we open up to citizen developers for building the apps, even large IT and enterprise IT, they get a whole lot of value because now they don't have to spend a lot of time building apps, targeting multiple platform. Um, so it drastically cut down. So it's something that you know, more and more enterprise customers are adopting, and we see a lot of value from the platform. So the data is the heart of everything. Think of uh, an app that doesn't deal with data. So it doesn't make sense, right? You cannot have a Power BI report without data. You need to connect to data. You cannot automate if you're not connecting or to a data service. So data is the heart of everything. And I just said, we have common data service, which allows you to store data onto our platform. But then we have a lot of data which is not on the common data service. You may have your data on SQL Server. You may have your data in your Oracle database. You can, you can be using some other uh, services where the data is stored. And this is where the connectors come in. So the connectors power the platform. The platform itself is very extensible. There are a lot of extensibility points that we provide on the platform. And it's not just connector. You can start, for instance, with Bar BI. For instance, you can use a custom connector if you don't provide a connector out of the box. You can have your own custom visuals. You can embed Power BI, and you can do Similar stuff on the Power Apps and the Flow side as well. You can have your own controls, basically, that you can embed in your app. So there are a lot of extensibility points that we provide on the platform. And connectors is just one of them. And this session, we are going to talk about custom connectors, specifically for Power Apps and Flow. All right, with that, I hand off to Kelly. So 
what is a connector? So a connector is basically just a wrapper around a RESTful API that allows the server to talk to the outside world. We have over 250 connectors today. We have our standard connectors that are available to anybody out of the box, things like the Outlook, all the Office um, connectors, right? Um, Twitter, Facebook, et cetera. We have premium connectors, so depending on the license you have, like a Salesforce, you might have access to some of these connectors, Salesforce and HCP or something like that. Those are really great for enterprises. Um, we also allow you, if you, your business hasn't made it up into the cloud yet and you need to connect to your on-premise data, we do have some connectors that allow you to connect to your VM, which is an option that's really a great way for Better speak a little loud. Oh. Going in now. Can you hear me now? <laughs> Is this better? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so we have um, SQL Server and SharePoint are um, some examples of the kind of uh, next. <laughs> Look this way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> So SharePoint and SQL Server are a couple of connectors, uh, examples of connectors that allow you to connect to on-premise um, data. And then of course we have your custom connectors. So if there's an API that um, isn't supported from one of our connectors that we provide but is publicly available, you can go in and create your own custom connector to connect to that so that you can support the scenario that you need. Similarly, if there's like an internal API um, to your specific organization, a custom connector that you can create and connect to that. So let's build a connector. Um, the example today we are going to um, build a connector with using the Yelp API, and I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with Yelp. Um, you can connect and search by businesses in a certain location, look at their ratings, their reviews, and so that's what we're going to do today. So let me switch over. So this is the Yelp documentation. They have a really great documentation on their API. So we're gonna use this business search. So you can search for businesses by keyword, category, location, price, et cetera. So how you create a connector, I'm gonna start the connector in Flow, but you can do the same in Power Apps, which is another great one. I'm in Flow and I'm under the data on the left side here. I clicked on custom connectors and this is what I see. I'm gonna go in the right top corner and click on new custom connector. And you can see there's multiple ways that you can create a custom connector. You can start from blank, which is what we're gonna do today. Um, you can create from an Azure service, which is a new feature we recently released, and I'll go into more detail about that in a few minutes. Um, if you have an open API file or URL, you can import it that way. Or if your API is in a Postman collection, you can import it that way. So we're gonna start from blank today. When I click on that, it's going to ask me for the name of my connector. So I'm just going to uh, call it Yelp Demo Review. Sorry, you guys. So now I'm in the portal here, and um, what you see is you can upload an icon for your custom connector. You can give it a description. I'll just say it's an MBAS demo for my description. Scroll down here, and I need to fill in the host. So when I come back over to uh, the Yelp API documentation, I can see that I need api.yelp.com. So I'm going to fill that in here. And go on to the next. And this is the security tab, and this is where you're going to put in the authentication type that their API requires. So we have several options here. Um, no auth, if uh, that's not required. Basic authentication, if you want to use username and password. API key and OAuth 2.0. And when I'm in the authentication part of the Yelp uh, documentation, I can see that it requires an API key. 
And it actually says to use, to set the authorization header uh, value as their state API key. So I'm gonna come back here and select API key now. And I'm gonna give it a label, I'll just put API, API key as my label, and then the parameter name is gonna be authorization. And then you can see there's two options here for header or query and um, that we support, but since the Yelp API required it in the header, we'll put it, we'll select header. Does it sound any better now? Yeah, okay, good. Then I'm gonna go on to the next uh, page here, and this is where you're gonna define um, what API you are going to be supporting um, in your connector. So you're gonna say, you're gonna want a new action. And what we're gonna do with the API with Yelp is we want to um, use this business, search business, because um, we wanna search by our keywords and have a list of businesses returned back to us. So in the summary here, I'm just gonna say search business. Uh, I'll say the same thing for the operation ID. And then I'll scroll down and I need to put in the request. And it's really nice because you can import it from sample. We know that it's gonna be a get request. Um, and the nice thing about um, the Yelp API is that they have a bunch of different examples here. So this is the one we want. We want to search for a business with a keyword. So they have the get call here and then they have this URL that we can copy and paste over and put right in here. Um, I'm actually gonna grab a different one I had saved because this one searches with the term parameter, latitude, and longitude, and I also wanna include the location in there, so I had uh, added the location in automatically. So just pull that over and paste that here. And then you put import, and then as you can see, it parsed the URL that I put in here, and it took all those query parameters and put them here. So you can see the search term, the location, the latitude, and the longitude. And I'm actually gonna go in and edit a couple of these. I'm gonna take the term and I'm gonna make it a required field. You can also fill in some descriptions and summaries if you want to, um, but that's all I'm gonna do for location and term. I'm not gonna make latitude and longitude required just because I feel like a lot of people wouldn't use that. Um, but I wanna make sure that they search for a term and a location so that the search comes back correct. And then now I need to put in the response. So I'll just click on response. And again, you can just import it from the sample. So it's really easy. Going back to the documentation, they have a great response here that I could just copy and paste over. Um, one thing to note is they do have this slash dot, dot, dot in here. So that's uh, obviously not gonna um, bode well with the JSON. So I just took that out and I have a copy of here that I already has that removed. So I'll just copy that over. But it's great when the API documentation has these responses that you can just use as your sample payload. So when I import that, again, you can see it parsed out all the schema for what we expect the response to be. And after that, I'm gonna create my connector up here. So you just click create connector. Give it some time to think. And then up here, hopefully it'll be successful. There. So now it's created. You can technically go in and start using it, but we wanna test it, make sure that everything's functioning correctly. So we're gonna go into the test tab and we're gonna create a connection to this new connector. And since it required um, an API key authorization, it's gonna ask for the API key. And I have one ready to go for this demo. So I'll paste that in there. And then you'll wanna refresh so you can see your connection. And here it is. And so now you can search and put in some dummy terms, uh, a term, so you could search for, say, a uh, hotel in Atlanta. Say test and see if it works. And as you can see, you've got a status of 200, it's returning data back, you have the Hampton Inn. Uh, yeah, so, so you know it's working because it's returning data. So now let's go use this and see it in a Power App. 
Um, I created just the beginning of a Power App here, um, just since we're in the middle of a demo and we have a certain time frame. But what I did was add a, added a text field here where you'll put your search term, um, a button here so when you click on search, it'll make the API call, and then a gallery here. And inside the gallery, I'm expecting a rating, um, the address, the name, and the image of what I searched for. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm gonna connect to my new connector. So I'm gonna click on data sources, and I'm gonna add a data source gonna look for my new connector called Yelp Demo. So there I'm connected to Yelp Demo. Um, in my gallery, what I had previously done was given the gallery a variable called search results so that when I do make my API call, um, I know that I want my results to go into this variable here. Then on the button is when I was gonna make my API call. So I have this already started, but basically, you'll come in here, let me just grab that. You're gonna set the variable search results and you're gonna make the API call to your Yelp demo connector using your search business action that you um, defined and you're taking in the input from this text field here, and then I just hard-coded Atlanta, um, just for time's sake, we're only just gonna take one, one field, um, uh, one input from the, the customer. Um, so I'm just gonna hard-code that, and then um, you're gonna need the response for businesses. And so now we're gonna see if this works. So we're gonna push play up here, and let's search for restaurants this time. And so again, it's searching for restaurants in Atlanta since we hard-coded Atlanta. I may need to refresh. I had this open for a while and I think it needs to refresh my authentication. thinking about it. Sorry. <laughs> We're almost done too. <laughs> so, so when you we added the uh, data source, yep. um, so she has already created the Yelp, so she was searching for Yelp, but if you don't have the connection created, you can say new connection and then you would be able to specify the key. Because she already did the testing, the connection that she created during the test is already there. That's what she did. So restaurants in Atlanta. I guess I should probably spell it right. But, oh, I don't see. Oh, there we go. Cool. There. So now you get all your restaurants in Atlanta. about the payload? Right, so it's a JSON and it's a DAP. Mm -hmm. It's nested and there are some nodes that you would need to give them the DAP process to flatten out the old node. What would you do? So it will not flatten out the uh, content, but what you will, uh, you would have seen is when we import the sample, 
it's able to describe using a schema. It's just one schema. So we should be able to handle that. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So let's, re let's recap. <laughs> Developing your custom connector. Um, what is required to develop a custom connector? First of all, you obviously need to understand the API for the service. It needs to be a RESTful API. Um, you can start, uh, create a connector from scratch like we did today with an open API definition, with a Postman collection, and then um, also with the Azure service. Um, and then you'll need to specify the authentic authentication type that is required by the API. So we had several that we um, support. And then define the operations in your connector um, and import the sample payload for the request and the response. And then all you need to do is save it, create it, test it, and then you can start using it in Flows and Power Apps. And you saw how quickly and how simple it was to create it and then start using it right away. So like I mentioned before, there is a new um, feature that we recently released uh, where you can create a custom connector from an Azure service. We currently support two services, Azure Functions and Logic Apps. Um, however, we are looking at adding more feature or more services in the future as well. Um, one thing to note, this is still in preview and it's still a work in progress. There are some prerequisites for Azure Functions. So, um, for instance, it does require that the app has a runtime version of one, and it also you need to make sure that you have in Azure already generated the open API definition because we need that swagger to, to import over. And then also you'll want to be sure that you enabled cross-origin resource sharing, so cores for um, Flow and or Power Apps, depending on where you're planning on using it. Um, so like I said, still to come, integration with more Azure services, um, streamlining, we want to work to improve the experience and streamline some of these experiences with Azure so that you're not having to go into the Azure portal, copy paste, bring it back over into Flow or Power Apps and bring it over there. So we are going to be continuing to um, work on streamli streamlining that experience too. And if you guys have any scenarios where you would like to use Azure, we would love to hear about those scenarios too. So really quickly, I'm just gonna demo how to create a custom connector with Azure Functions. I'm not gonna go too far into it since we just created a connector, but I'll just show you how simple and fast that it is to do. So let me switch back over. All right, so I'm back in the Flow portal. Again, you can do this in the Power Apps portal as well. And under Data, click on Custom Connectors, and I'm on this page. So now I'm gonna go up to click New Custom Connector, and this is when I'm gonna select Create from an Azure service. So you'll see when we created from Blank, all it asked for was a custom connector name, and this time there's some more fields that we need to fill in. So the first one is a name, so I'll just say um, Demo. And then um, since I'm already logged in, it, can, it knows which subscriptions are available to me. So I'm gonna click on the drop down to see all my subscriptions, maybe. And I'll select the subscription that I know my API is under. Next is the Azure service. So you can choose either functions or logic apps for now. So if I click on Logic Apps, it's then going to show me all of the Logic Apps available to me to use. Or if I click on Azure Functions, I can see all the Azure Function apps available for me. So I'm just going to grab one. Sometimes it gets sticky. click continue, and then this looks familiar. This is where we were before. So again, you can add your icon and your description, but what you'll see is the host was automatically filled in for me. I'll go on to the next tab, security tab, and in my Azure function, I had said that uh, the auth type would be an API key. So it grabbed that automatically for me, filled it in, filled in the, AP, the label, the name, and the parameter location for me. Um, automatically, so I don't need to do anything there. I could just continue on into the definition tab. And here I can see my action is already defined too. I could just add a summary here. Uh, description came over a little messy, but I can fix that up. My operation ID was filled in. I 
have a request URL here already and a response. So now all I need to do is click Create Connector. And as you can see, it was success successfully created. So now I can just go on, test it, create that connection, test it, and then start using it. And I won't go into that since we already did that. But you can see I didn't have to do anything. It just pulled everything over from my Azure function, and I just needed to go and create that custom connector that way. So that's, that's the new um, capability we recently released. Like I said, it's still in preview, and we are looking at making some improvements to some of the experiences that you'll undertake. And, and if you have any um, scenarios for Azure you'd love to see, um, I, I would love to talk to you. Come on over to the Flow booth after this. But that's that. Thank you. So the importance for supporting Azure functions and uh, logic apps is huge in the sense that many of the enterprise that we talk to they have a whole stack of app development. They, most of them use Azure. Uh, many of them use Azure Functions to expose many APIs. Many of them use Azure Logic Apps as well. So integration with Flow and Power Apps, we hope is going to be very useful for our customers. Okay, thank you. So now we talk about some of the more advanced uh, techniques or topics, basically. Um, so first, how does the connector work? So let's quickly look into how it works, the architecture. On the left side, we have Flow and Power Apps, which is where which is fronting the user. So they, they send the request. And on the right side, uh, we have the REST API. So this is the API, the backend service that you want to invoke. And in between, what we have is the Azure API M gateway. It's the same thing as the Azure API M management uh, we have, but just that we, we front all the connectors, including custom connectors using an Azure API M account. And we take care of uh, some of the token management, the credential management uh, using this account. So the, wor the way it works is when you have a call coming from Flow or Power App, it's coming in the context of what is the connection ID, what operation you want to invoke. Right? and which connector you want to call, obviously. So this, this, this information comes through. It has nothing about, okay, what API key you want to use, what authentication you want to use with the RESTful, with the backend service, because that's something that you have is already established when you create the connection. So now the API will go and, using the connection ID, will go and fetch the credential. It will only do that if the user who is invoking that has the permission to use that particular connection. And then once it, once it fits the credential, it will translate it into the appropriate uh, host, the appropriate API path, passing the credentials so that the backend service understands how to process that request. And then when the response comes, we just give the response back to Power Apps and Flow. So at a high level, uh, it's very simple. You have a REST API. We have an API M gateway in between that is doing the translation. And the reason why I want to quickly show you this one is, as we talk about some of the more advanced stuff, understanding this architecture will help. So if you don't have a REST API, let's say you want to connect to a SQL uh, server, right? What you do is the first thing you have to do is to create a web API. Once you create that web API, you can register it as a custom connector. So it works, everything works, um, you know, everything works the same once you have your REST API. And as Kelly was saying, if you have an Azure function, the way it works is exactly the same. Azure function exposes a REST API and it goes via our gateway so that um, through the custom connector that you create. And if you have your data on-premise, we provide a one-click experience that says that, okay, my API is on-premise. So if you go back your, to the custom connector portal, there is one flag where you have to check that says my data is on-premise. And then we take care of tunneling all the requests for your custom API through the on-premise data gateway. So this is something that the user will have to set up, install. What it does is it allows you to connect to any 
uh, data sources that you have on-premise securely through the web, okay? The other thing that we just wanted to announce is we have realized the importance of, of engaging the community and maintaining the connectors that we have. Uh, there, there have been a lot of questions about how people can build custom connectors. Uh, there have been a lot of feedback on the out-of-the-box connectors that we have. People have asked for new, con uh, new connectors. People have asked for features in our existing connectors. So we started open sourcing uh, connectors as well in, on GitHub. And this is something which uh, we are really excited about. And I hope that we can also get a lot of uh, contributions from the community. We have a huge community for Dynamics and the Power Platform. So we expect this is something that will play an important role going forward. So we started open sourcing on GitHub. We have a source code for the certified connectors. Uh, we also provide a bunch of samples that you can go ahead and look. Um, and then we also open source uh, the tooling that uh, we'll have. All right. So one of the key thing that, is, uh, that enables this open sourcing is our CLI tool. So today, when you look at how you build custom connector, we use the portal. So everything happens through the UI, but a portal is, is really good to get started. However, um, many of you are DevOps, right? So you have your own DevOps cycle. You want to check in your source code into you know, your source, code, source control system, like GitHub or any, any source control system. So it's not possible to do that if we just provide you a portal. So the, this is where the CLI comes in. So using the CLI, you can, you can persist your connector artifacts onto disk, which you can now sync, which you can now check in and use any code reposit, source code repository of your choice. And that's something that CLI tool allows you. So we support a lot of commands. We allow you to download any connector using the CLI tool. You can create new connectors. Uh, you can update and you can also validate to check if there are any error or anything, uh, any, any fixes that you have to do on your connector. So I'll just give you a very quick demo of how that works. Right, yeah, thank you. So this is our uh, open source GitHub repository. So as you can see, we have uh, source code for the connectors, we have samples, uh, we have a uh, you know, bunch of samples here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to use one of the sample, in this case, uh, the Facebook sample, deploy it using the uh, CLI tool, and then uh, we'll see how that can be done. So if you look into this Facebook connector sample, there are a couple of prerequisites it says. Right? You say you have to create a Facebook app. This is, this is because in order to use the Facebook API, you have to create an app in Facebook. So this is something that I have done. So if you go to the Facebook uh, developer account, I have this lot of apps that I've created. So we have one of the app called Power Apps Demo. <coughs> and you can see the settings. Um, you can see you know, the app ID and the secret, which is something that we are going to need. So once you create the um, Facebook app, you, we ask you to replace your client ID with the Facebook app ID that you get, and then we are going to use the CLI tool to create a connector. So as you can see, I don't have any Facebook connector on my account, so I will just go ahead and see how we can use that uh, CLI tool to create that. So the first thing I do is to log in, because um, this will authenticate the tool. So let's go ahead and log in. So I go to this URL very quickly, copy the URL here, and I have to enter this code. So this will authenticate the use of the CLI on my machine. So I'll go ahead and sign in. And so it is approved, and you should be able to see that login is successful. Now I can go ahead and create. So the first thing that you can do is for any of the uh, command, uh, you can always use this command to see what the syntax is, right? So what argument you need to provide, um, you know, how you can use that command. 
So you can see that I have to specify the API definition, the API properties, so, and then I have to specify the secret as well. All right, so I have all that. This is my, oh, is that, okay. So now this will go ahead and try to create a custom connector uh, for uh, the Facebook API. Uh, so as you can see, it asked me what environment uh, that I want to use. As you can see, I have like tons of environment. This is the hardest part of the demo, which is figuring out what environment that I have to use. Should be somewhere in the middle. Yes, this one, it, the number keeps changing. So it's number 69, similar to yes demo. So we just pick that one. And once we select the environment, this will now go ahead and create a custom connector for us, right? So just like that, we have created a custom connector. So now if I go back and refresh our page to see if we have a new custom connector and you can see that the Facebook connector is here, right? And so now we can use this Facebook connector. So it's so easy to create uh, you know, once we have the samples, the source code available using the CLI to quickly create. If you want to make updates, you can make updates. You can download the, uh, the, the, uh, the connector back onto your desk, or you can make update onto your desk and deploy it again. You can do all that, right? <coughs> okay, so going back. Yeah. Oh, give me one. Sorry. Want this one? Okay, cool. Okay, so this is how uh, we create using the CLI. Okay, so next topic uh, that we wanted to quickly talk about is the trigger. So we help a bunch of partner build the connector onto our platform. This is how we got to over 250 connectors today. Many of them, a bunch, majority of them are built by our external partner. And this is where we get the feedback from our partners on what tooling to improve. So one of the biggest uh, challenges that we have today that is how do you build a trigger? A trigger is something that kicks off a flow. It's, uh, it's any interesting event that kicks off a flow. It could be based on time. It could be based on, for instance, someone, you receiving an email or someone posting a tweet or it could be someone posting a comment on your Facebook page. So it could be you know, a bunch of events that happens onto your service. And based on that, uh, you want to kick off a flow. So there are two ways in which you can build a trigger. One is based on webhook, the other is based on polling. Webhook is more efficient. Uh, the way it works is flow or our engine will subscribe to the backend service saying that I'm interested in these events and whenever that events happen, the backend service will, il will invoke or we'll push a notification to our flow uh, service and then the flow will kick off. So it's very efficient in the sense that as long as nothing happens, there is no data transfer happening. However, it requires that the backend service do support webhooks. It, and also sometimes what happens is because it is based on notification, some notification may get lost. We have seen that happen. The other way to build uh, a trigger is based on polling. Now in the case of polling, what happens is the flow service will go and check you know, every few minutes to see if there are new events. If there are events, that should kick off the flow. And if there are new events, then it will kick off the flow. So it's very chatty, but it's very easy to implement because there is no requirement on, or there's less requirement on <coughs> Uh, the backend service, for instance, to, uh, to implement a webhook kind of a infrastructure, right? So let me go ahead and uh, tell you a little bit about uh, how polling works. If it goes to the next screen, okay. So the way I'm just quickly going to go over how it works. Um, the way it works is based on what we call as a 202 HTTP async pattern. So the first time when the flow is set up, the flow runtime will invoke a call on the trigger that says, okay, this is the API that I want to call. The connector will go and invoke the backend service to say, okay, give me the data that you have, right? And 
what happens is the backend service will return you a bunch of data. But this is only used to establish the state, the initial state, okay? So the connector will return back saying, fine, this is the state, so I've seen where the state is, so it will return 202, it's accepted, with a retry after, this says, okay, come back after some time, and it provides a location header. And in the location header, we initialize a state. The state is used to keep track of till how far you have seen the data. And after some time, what happens is, next call will come from flow, as the polling, and in, it will use the location header. So because we pass the state as location header, the flow runtime is going to pass the same state. So in this case, example, for instance, I've said state equal to one, right? The connector now knows that because of the state equal to one, it will translate into the appropriate API that will do the appropriate filtering so that you can get the right set of data. For, in, for instance, it may translate it into a filtered query that says created date is greater than certain timestamp, okay? And if there is no data, you will get a empty payload back. And in this case, the connector will return back to flow saying there is no data, come back after some time. So again, 202, retry after a certain number of seconds and with, a, with the same uh, location header that has the same state. After some time, the next time it comes, the same thing happens, but if there is a new data that comes back from the backend server. In this case, what the connector will do is the connector, instead of, instead of returning 200 or 202 two accepted, is going to respond back with 200 okay, saying, okay, we have new data. So it goes back to flow, and then the flow will kick off based on the data. So this is how polling works. It's, as I said, it's, uh, you know, most of the triggers that we have today is implemented this way. In the future, we are, we are thinking of uh, coming up a mechanism where uh, we want to use the advantage of a polling trigger, the fact that it doesn't lose data, along, com along with the efficiency of a webhook. So this is something what we call as a hybrid trigger. That's something that we are working on, but right now, the way to build trigger is through webhooks or through polling. So let's do a quick demo and see how that works. Okay, so we have the Facebook connector that we just created. Now let's see how we can uh, add a trigger to it. So I, oopsies, all right. So let's go and edit the connector and we have the definition. So right now it has no trigger. So we're going to go ahead and add a trigger. And the way, I just click on something. <laughs> Sorry guys. <laughs> All right, so we, we are going to add a new trigger. And the example in this case that I'm going to use is, I have this Facebook page and whenever I post something on this Facebook page, I want to kick off a flow, okay? So you have to read a little bit of the API documentation, how it works, but in the case of Facebook, what they, ha they do provide is they provide a way to paginate through results using what they call as cursor. And it's really nothing, but they give you uh, pagination information and they say, you can use before or after. So we are going to use the before and the after as a way to keep track of how far we have seen, okay? So now I will go and create a trigger. Let's just call it on a new post. Give an operation ID, let's just call it on new post. And then I select polling here because we are going to use a polling trigger. And just like how we do it for actions, you can import from a sample. So in this case, we are going to use this API. And I will explain what this API is. This API is hitting the graph endpoint, the Facebook API endpoint, which is graph.facebook.com. It requires a page ID 
and then you know you can use this uh, flag uh, this query parameter before and you provide some value and it's going to give you all the results which come after that okay so this is what we are going to use so I'll copy this and let's put it here and I would say import and you can see that it asks for a PS ID and the before query parameter. The PS ID is a required parameter. We'll keep it here for some time. And then the before field. So it's a query parameter, but that is something that you don't want the user to provide the value because there's something that we want to use to keep track of the state. So I'm just going to say this is an internal parameter. Go back, fix it. And then we're going to provide the response payload. So the response payload for Facebook looks like this. So it gives you the data and then it gives you the paging information. So I'm just going to copy this again. And like this, All right? And I'll say import and I have the response payload imported. <laughs> so if you see all the response payload is imported here. Cool. So now this is the trigger configuration. The first thing that I, I have to specify is what query parameter do you want to use to monitor the state? In this case, I want to use the before. And it says, okay, how do you want to initialize this, uh, this field? And this is where you do a little bit of magic uh, to say that. What we want to do is we want to initialize it to this value, whatever the API returns. So. We can write a nice expression to do that, which is, and you can read about all this expression here, uh, you know, in a link in the documentation. But what it does is it says in the trigger body, I want to look for this field, paging, cursor, and before. And I want to initialize to that. So I'll just copy this, and I want to initialize to this value. And sing, next thing it says is, okay, what is the collection which contains the data, which is the trigger body data? So as I said, this is how the payload looks like. So this is what contains the collection of the data that we want to return. So this is how you initialize it. And then the trigger hint is something that you want to, you want to uh, give to the end user to test the trigger. So you can say to, to test this, this trigger, uh, post on a Facebook page, okay? And then I update the connector. So this is how you write a trigger. Now let's see if it is working. So I can create a new flow. Uh, let's get, right? Let's give, let's give a name or we'll generate one so we can skip that, so Facebook. And this is the new trigger that I have created on a new post. So I say create. It asked me to sign in. So let's go ahead and sign in to my Facebook account. <coughs> it sign in, it asked me for a page ID. Uh, so this is the page, this is the page that we want to use. This is the ID. So in this case, I have the ID here and we'll come back and fix it. How we can, be, how that can be done. So I'm just copying the ID here. I'm going to use a PS ID. And then when you can add the rest of the steps, what you want to do when a new post happens, right? In this case, let's just say, uh, yeah, um, you know, let's not do this. Let's just put compose so that we can see the output, right? All right. So I'm not doing much, but you know you can you can uh, you know create the flow, right? So what it's doing is it just print the output right here to see how it works. So I'll save the flow, and then I can uh, test the flow, right? So this is a hint uh, to test this trigger post post on a Facebook page. This may take a few minutes, so let's go ahead and post here and say the and that's 2019 session is great okay i say sure now what is this 
sorry about that. Okay, so now I, ha I have just created I just created a post on this Facebook page. Uh, just go ahead, and you can see that the flow runs successfully, right? And hopefully, in the output, you should be able to see the post that I have, which is the embed session is great, right? So this is how easy, uh, not so easy, I know, <laughs> but this is how you create a polling trigger. I hope it's useful. All right, cool. Thank you. All right, so now we know how to, how to build a trigger. Very briefly, this is what you do. I'm not going to go into the details of each of those things, but you know, it works on, there are some UI configuration that we give. There, you can also do it using, because we have the CLI tool, you can download it and see how it works. And the way it works is based on what a new feature that we uh, released last month is called the polling, temp, uh, it's called the policy template. So what are policies? So typically what we have seen is when developers create the API, they target developers. They, off, they don't target business users like you and I, okay? I'm assuming all of us are business users. So sometimes what you, you have to do is you have to change the behavior of the API a little bit. The example would be, let's say you want to create a connector for an Azure blob. Now the API will take the name of the container in the API path. Now that's something that you cannot do you know, with custom connector. So a, a policy can be applied to say, hey, I want to take the name of the storage account as a connection parameter, and then you can route it to appropriately, like account name dot blob dot core dot, dot windows dot net, right? So you can route it dynamically. There are, so those are something called policy templates. It's something that we announced um, last month and we have seen a lot of uptakes because it enables a bunch of features which is not possible earlier. And the polling uh, trigger that we just, I just showed you is also based on policy templates. So one last demo that I want to show you before we get to the rest of the, right? Okay. <clears throat> so there's one last thing that I want to show you, right? Which is, this ID, who, who, who will remember <laughs> the page ID? If, so for a connector to be successful, right, we want to provide the right user experience. So it would have been nice, and if you have used many of the uh, connectors that we provide on the platform, we often give you a list of drop downs of things. So let, let's see how we can fix this connector so that it shows a drop down of all the pages. So let's go back to our custom connector to see how that can be done. And let's edit this custom connector. I go to our definition. I go to the trigger. And one of the parameters that I have is, is a page ID. So I can go and edit this parameter. And you can see that this asks for a lot of information of that particular parameter, right? You can give the description, but <coughs> one of the thing that um, people, often um, ignore is what we call as the drop down type. This is what we call as, hey, if, if it is a parameter, do you want to give it drop down or not, right? So in this case, it's disabled. So you can either give a static list, a comma separated list, but in this case, we want to retrieve the list of pages for the user. So you can say it is a dynamic drop down. So you click on dynamic stuff. And then if it is a dynamic dropdown, what happens is we are going to make a call to the connector to retrieve the value that you want to show. So it asks for what operations provide the value of that dynamic dropdown. So thankfully for us, we have this operation called get accounts. Even though the name says get accounts, um, that's because Facebook call it accounts. It gives you the list of pages that you own. So you can say this is the operation that you want to use. And then it, it has a accept parameter. Um, yep, I think we can use this. Okay, so this, this is a hidden parameter where it says you want to retrieve it as an application JSON. 
typically most uh, operations will not have it. But it says, what value do you want to use from the dropdown? So we look into the output of that operation and you say, the value that I want to use is the ID, okay? And the ID is what the number is, two, zero, whatever that you showed, right? The one that I copy pasted. But that's not what you want to show to the user because if you start showing all those random numbers, people do not understand what it is. So we give you a display value as well. And the display value is a nice name that you get. So once you save this one, you, you, can, uh, you can update the connector. So let's update the connector and then we can go back to our flow or, or you want to create a new flow. Hopefully it should work. And you see a drop down right here, right? So I have two pages, basically, instead of seeing that number, it ha it, it's making an API call to retrieve the list of Facebook pages and you can go and ask the user to select what it is. Okay, so, so yeah, that's the end of our demo session. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so one last thing. So as we build out these connectors, as I said, we want to get your contributions into our open source repository. You can submit your contribution, uh, bug fixes to our existing connectors or as uh, sample connectors. So if you own the backend service, you can also certify the connector. This is how you release the connector onto our platform. There's a lot of benefit to doing that one. Essentially because we have already given more than 250 connectors, the moment you certify your connector, your customers will also be, will be able to leverage the power of the platform. You have seen how easy it is for someone to build an app, right? Using the Yelp demo that Kelly just showed. So that is one. So it empowers your customers and our customers uh, to build apps. And because we have over 250 connectors, once you build a connector, people can use the flow, uh, Microsoft Flow to integrate with those other services as well. So there is a lot of value to certifying your connector. We do welcome all the partners to certify their connectors. You, we have a way to do the certification. You submit your connector to us. We are investing in a lot of tooling to improve this process. This is something that we own. And as you have seen, it takes just a few weeks or even days to build a connector. We have seen partners who have released and built a connector within a week. So the value that you get out of building a connector is huge. It doesn't take a lot of effort. You can start by a few, with a few operations and you can update as necessary. All right, so in summary, what we want to say is that the Microsoft Power Platform is what I feel as a game-changing platform. It brings a ton of value. With custom connectors, you can unblock a lot of sales. Um, you can unblock a lot of scenarios that we do not provide with out-of-the-box connectors. So it's a one uh, way to extend the platform. And it's super easy to build custom connectors. You can just do it in a matter of days. The most time will be in understanding what that API is and what the documentation is. So you should build your connectors now. And if you have built a great custom connector, we want to learn about that one use our GitHub repository to submit and provide us feedback. Thank you. Any questions? Yeah.